As someone with predominantly a metal and punk background, I've been venturing more into industrial music lately, and I've wanted to read up on it. So we have Assimilate, a critical history of industrial music. You know your book is off to a good start when it's named after a skinny puppy song. What it details are the ideologies behind the music, the label contributions, the musicians involved, how geography affected the music in question, and how the music evolved over time. It goes as far back as the early 1900s when it talks about the Futurist movement and how the ideas from that era carried over to the 1970s when Throb and Gristle and other bands started using those ideas. It also talks about the Fluxus movement and uh, William S. Burroughs and all of his ideas and how they carried over to some of the industrial bands in the 70s and 80s. A lot of pages in this book talk about Throb and Gristle and Cabaret Voltaire, but I feel like Kraftwerk was glossed over. I mean, Kraftwerk clearly had some industrial sounds at the same time as Throbbing Gristle, or even before Throbbing Gristle. I mean, Throbbing Gristle may have coined the term industrial, but Kraftwerk would have been worth mentioning more. Anyway, the book also talks about the importance of the male art scene of the 1970s and the tape trading scene of the 1980s. My favorite part of the book has to be the history and background of the Wax Tracks label. Just reading about the way things got released and who was involved was just really stimulating. I did feel a bit slighted when the author started talking about Nine Inch Nails' Pretty Hate Machine, though. The impression that I got from his descriptions of the album was that while it was helpful in making Industrial more popular, it was bad because it was easier to listen to. Sometimes I am not in the mood to listen to Throbbing Gristle 24-7. Sometimes I want to listen to structured songs such as KMFDM or Lords of Acid. But one, Pretty Hate Machine is one of my favorite albums ever, so even if I try to be unbiased while I'm reading this, it's a little hard not to cringe. Second of all, being more accessible and easier to listen to is not necessarily a bad thing. For instance, I like Skinny Puppy's Rabies way more than I like Vivisect 6. Not that Vivisect 6 is a bad album, it's just that Rabies has better synths, better samples, better production, better songs, and ultimately, it's also easier to listen to. Being easier to listen to isn't a bad thing, but it's this thing that some fans have where, you know, some fans might think that Frontline Assembly is too mainstream, or Nine Inch Nails is too mainstream. Look, if it's good music, then it's good music. That's the way I see it. The chapters about fascism, sexism, and demographics lost my interest, though. It could be because I'm used to seeing the same number of women as men at these industrial concerts I go to or listening to them on a daily basis. But I also have to remember that a lot of these things happened before I was born, so there are some things that I'll never know. Regardless, it's just hard to imagine industrial music's audience being 80% male. There are a lot of women who listen to industrial, just like there are a lot of women who listen to metal. And then the book talked about the anti-fascist ideologies that some of the bands have and how the ideologies and the music contradicted each other. Industrial, for the most part, always gave me the message about personal freedom, expression, and deprogramming. So these bands just never came off as fascist to me. I do not like talking about politics to begin with, so reading this chapter of the book was a bit off-putting for me. Many other readers would agree with me that the chapter talking about industrial music having mostly white musicians and white audiences, that was highly off-putting. If you want to claim that industrial music has a race issue, go ahead, but don't use white guilt to get your point across. But I mean, the author is also overlooking a couple of important things, like the geography of some of these bands. For instance, if you are going to see a Lords of Acid or a Front 242 show in Belgium, Obviously, there aren't going to be many black people at the shows, because guess what? There aren't many black people in Belgium like there are in the United States or in other countries. So do not play the race card with me on this. Industrial music is made for everybody. Maybe it was important to discuss the race issue, because there are bands like Ramstein and a couple of other bands that have been accused of Nazism in the past, but I don't know. I think the way that the author went about this was a little wrong. In many respects, I am seeing parallels between Industrial's history and Death Metal's history. For one, the tape trading scene. It expanded ideas and connected a lot of musicians together. This happened in both Industrial music and Underground Metal. And then, in the 90s and 2000s, there were a lot of key musicians that died in both scenes. You know, on Industrial side, you know, you have Dwayne Gattel from Skinny Puppy, you have a couple of the members from Ministry and Revolting Cox. And then, on the metal side, you have Euronymous, you have Corthon, you have Chuck Skuldiner. And then, after some of these members died, the scene changed. But I've also noticed corporate powers closing in on labels like Wax Tracks, trying to pick up the bigger bands. The same thing happened with Earache, when Sony and Columbia were trying to collaborate with them on the bigger bands. 
Part of me thinks that the way this book was written made it sound pretentious sometimes. Such as the way the author describes going to a Chris and Cozy show near the end of the book. Or also the way magazine writers are referred to as scholars. Not to mention the academic style that this book was written in probably made some things sound more important than they actually were. I thought the ending was a bit ballsy too. Like the author would claim at the end of the book that industrial music was dead and hardly had any new ideas to offer. Well, you're, you're forgetting the whole point of industrial music is to be progressive and evolutionary. Listen, I've heard people claim that industrial music isn't made like it used to be. And it makes sense because times have changed. A lot of the labels have died out, a lot of the bands aren't together anymore, production values have changed, label practices have changed, and the musicians are either dead or older now. So obviously it's not going to have the same grittiness, it's not going to have the same angst, it's not even going to have the same sound. But there are still plenty of new ideas that you can get from industrial music. Just like metal, the music keeps evolving. Whether you like future pop or not, it shows that the ideas of industrial are being expanded upon. Plus, there are plenty of new industrial bands that are worth listening to. And that's the thing, the author stops at about 2000 and he hardly mentions any newer industrial acts. Anyway, if you want to read this book for all the positive things I've mentioned, go ahead, but take it with a large grain of salt. Also, it would be a good idea to get into industrial music before you read the book. This isn't like choosing death. You know, with choosing death, you could listen to a couple of albums and then read the book and learn a nice bit about a whole bunch of different bands. Not with this book. This book throws a lot of information at you on some things, and then other things are just glossed over. Regardless of which, if you're a fan of the music, go for it.